gracious God, open our hearts, open our minds, open our spirits, open our bodies to receive every bit of the good news that you want us to receive today as your word is read and proclaimed. Amen. The first scripture reading this morning is Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 15 through 20. Hear the word of the Lord. See, I have set before you today life and prosperity, death and adversity. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I am commanding you today by loving the Lord your God, walking in his ways, and observing his commandments, decrees, and ordinances, then you shall live and become numerous And the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away and you do not hear, but are led astray to bow down to other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall perish. You shall not live long in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death blessings, and curses. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying him and holding fast to him, for that means life to you and length of days, so that you may live in the land that the Lord swore to give to your ancestors, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Chapters uh, 14, 15, 16, and 17 in John's Gospel really form one unit. It's known as Jesus' farewell discourse to the disciples. Now, over in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we think mainly of his final instructions as occurring during the Last Supper. But here, John is much more expansive. And our reading this morning Uh, actually begins this uh, final discourse. I think these words will be familiar to you, so let us uh, hear the word of God. Jesus points the way to God by saying this, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, Would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to Jesus, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. This is the word of the Lord. The song, Try to Remember, from the musical The Fantastics, sometimes plays on a a loop in my mind. It haunts me for reasons that I don't quite understand. Before the mud of Woodstock, uh, before Neil Armstrong walked on the moon, before this Neil graduated from college, before Elizabeth Taylor won the Academy Award in uh, Butterfield 8, and before Wilt Chamberlain scored 52 points in his first varsity basketball game for Kansas University, the song Try to Remember had become part of our national music heritage. The show's original off-Broadway production ran a total of 42 years and 17,162 performances before the Sullivan Street Playhouse closed for the last time on January the 13th, 2002. I think that was some kind of record for Broadway plays. 
Janet and I first saw the production a number of years ago in Texas, and then again two years ago this month at the Spencer Theater at the University of Missouri at Kansas City. The play opens with the mystical and uh, romantic song. Try to remember the kind of September when life was slow and oh so mellow. The young lovers, Matt and Louisa, live next door to each other and as fate would have it, they fall in love. The first stanza of the song ends with, try to remember and if you remember, then follow. With the word follow repeated nine times like an echo, follow, follow, follow. Follow what? One's dreams? One's first love? One's hopes for the future? Well, it never was clear to me. Nevertheless, the song did come to mind when I began to reflect on our New Testament reading, and particularly verse 6, where Jesus answers Thomas' question about where he is going. I am the way, Jesus responds, and the truth and the life. I find it interesting that in the preceding chapter in John's Gospel, the Apostle Peter asks the same question. Lord, where are you going? And to that, Jesus doesn't answer the question very directly. He tells Peter, where I am going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow afterward. And as I mentioned to Thomas, he simply affirms, I am the way. So follow, follow, follow me. Now, I have read these lines from John 14 many times through the years, most often at a funeral or memorial service. They remind us that Jesus has gone and prepared a special place in heaven for us that has many rooms, to use the older translation. We have, it seems, our own personal space reserved for us a rather idealized uh, notion of what the next life will look like. Indeed, it bears some resemblance to how we might have felt when we first fell in love. Everything was wonderful. It, we lived in some kind of an ideal dream world. We left behind the present with all of its troubles. Who needs reality when we're in love? Sound familiar? Well, Matt and Louisa in the play uh, naively live there in their own dream world, unable to see beyond the wall that separated them and their home. And then Louisa is kidnapped, and their dream world falls apart. Even as Matt also gets exposed to the real world with its pain and its unpredictability. When they finally get together after a series of adventures, they realize they can only understand true love after they first encounter hurt and pain. Where is Jesus going? Both Peter and Thomas want to know. And when Jesus proclaims, I am the way, he speaks not of some faraway fantasy world where everyone will get tucked into their own bed at night. No, as our opening hymn reminded us, he's going first to the cross and a brutal death before his resurrection, which we celebrated last week on Easter Sunday. The cross and the resurrection two sides of the same coin. You cannot have one without the other. Indeed, just seven days removed from the hallelujahs of Easter, this morning we celebrate the sacrament of the Lord's Supper that reminds us of Jesus' body broken and his blood shed, a crucified and risen Savior 
who bids us to follow him through all of the pain and pleasure, the failures and triumphs, the dreams and reality, love gained and love lost, traveling the ruts and detours and expressways of life. Follow, follow, follow this one who claims that he and God are one and the same, who declares, if you know me, you will know my Father also. Almost four years ago, Janet and I visited Ground Zero in New York City, the memorial to more than 2,600 lives lost at the World Trade Center in Manhattan during the terrorist attack, attack on September the 11th, 2001. I didn't realize it at the time, but actor and singer Jerry Orbach, perhaps best known uh, for his portrayal as uh, Detective Lenny Briscoe in the crime drama Law and Order, sang this hit song from the Fantastics at Ground Zero one year after the attack. Deep in December, it's nice to remember without a hurt, the heart is hollow. There was a lot of hurt that day, and many who were present cried as they remembered the tragedy of the year before. Amy Gammerman, a critic for the Wall Street Journal, who showed up at a performance of the Fantastics on September the 14th, a mere three days after the attack, was the first to make a connection between the song and September the 11th. Only about two dozen people were in the audience in the theater just a few blocks from Ground Zero. Referring to the song, Try to Remember, Gammerman wrote, a familiar old ballad was suddenly transformed into a plaintive elegy for the innocence we had all lost. By the end of the song, I was in tears, and so was one of the actors. First, we remember when our hearts were broken. Then we remember when our hearts were healed. First, we remember Good Friday, and then we remember Easter. First, we remember the cross, and then we remember the empty tomb. First, we remember the tears of sorrow over the death of the Son of God, and then we remember the tears of joy at the resurrection of the Son of God. And then we follow, follow, follow Christ on the way. Did you know that the way was one of the earliest names for the followers of Christ, even before they were called Christians? Check out Acts chapter 9, verse 2. Today we still are followers of the way that leads to the truth, and that results in life, abundant life now, eternal life later. Henceforth, writes scholar Gerard Slocan, Jesus is known as the way to the cross and the resurrection. Tom Curry, Presbyterian minister colleague, pastored the first Presbyterian church in Kerrville, Texas, a few years after I had left that congregation to go to Louisville, Kentucky. And now he is also retired, as am I, and raises the pointed question for us, living in a world with multiple threats and challenges. He writes, how do we proclaim the gospel in a culture bent on its own lethal self-justification, its worship of wealth, its comfortable ability to ignore or, or dismiss the cries of others, its easy acceptance of the brutality of its own politics, the ruthlessness of its own getting and spending, the self-absorption of its own idolatries, and perhaps worst of all, its own quiet hopelessness. 
his last example particularly resonates with me. How do we proclaim the gospel in a culture of quiet hopelessness? Many things contribute to my sense of quiet hopelessness, and not the least of which is the spate of school shootings we've seen over the past several years. Beginning with Columbine in 1999, more than 187,000 students attending at least 193 primary or secondary schools have experienced a shooting on campus during school hours. An average of 10 school shootings every year since Columbine in 1999. I went to high school in the 1950s, a small little town in West Texas where the outside doors on schools were not secured, at least during school time. There were no locks on the doors. No security guard was posted. And when the most violent action occurring was being sent to the assistant coach's office for discipline, Coach M.C. Joan was about six feet four inches tall and weighed somewhere around 240 pounds. And I can personally testify that he wielded a paddle this long with great force. I can feel it yet today. So how do we proclaim the gospel in an era of violence inflicted on our children and youth in a culture of quiet hopelessness. Well, no doubt we will continue to debate without resolution how to increase and improve access to mental health resources, make gun possession more difficult to obtain, hire more security guards for the school, or arm the teachers. Dear God, I hope not. I don't pretend to have all the answers. What I propose, therefore, comprises not a solution, but a way back to sanity, a way to achieve or regain respect for human life, a way to love one another more completely, and a way for faith in divine guidance, without which hope for a better future becomes impossible. If the world is such a mess, perhaps you're wondering, what in the world can I possibly do to make it better? Well, God doesn't call on us to solve the world's problems. God calls each of us the same way Jesus called his disciples, with just two words, follow me. Brief but profound, simple but complex, easy but very difficult. He gave us the road map, you remember? You know it as well as I do. Love God with your whole being, show charity, and treat others in need the way we would want to be treated if we were in the same or similar circumstances. Brief but profound. Simple but complex. Easy but sometimes very difficult. Follow, follow, follow. Follow Jesus. Reject the violent ways of the world. Instead, follow the Son of God who is the way, the truth, and the life. He will lead us directly to God. And there is no place I'd rather be. How about you? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.